So I guess it's start. Oops. Time to start. I think room is full. If you want, you can start. Okay. So we are going to start. So my name is Adrien Grand. I'm a software engineer at Elasticsearch as well as a committer on the Apache Lutzen project. And today we are going to talk together for about 20 minutes about aggregations in Elasticsearch. So aggregations are a new feature of Elasticsearch which have been introduced in the release 1.0. And so that was four months ago in January. And today I'm going to talk about what aggregations are, why we build them, and also about how they work. I think it's important to get some basic understanding of how they work because it will help you understand the trade-offs that we've made when designing aggregations. And ultimately, this is going to be helpful for you in order to understand whether or not there is the right tool, the right tool to tackle the problems that you are having. So I won't give any example about syntax and response format. It's only going to be about what they can do and how they work. So aggregations are all about analytics. They allow you to compute histograms, distributions of value, any kind of statistics. And they have some key features. One key feature is that they can be run on any partition of your data, which means that whatever you can match with a query, such as what? Does it work? Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, any query that Clinton just described can be used. Uh, and you can use this query in order to select the set of documents that you'd like to aggregate on. And everything is going to be computed in near real time. So what does near real time mean? It means that one, two. Yeah. It works now. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. So, so what this refresh interval means that when you index data, you might need to wait until this amount of time before data becomes visible to, for search, and by default, it would be one second for Elasticsearch. So th that might sound like a very hard drawback for Elasticsearch, if, especially if you compare it to more traditional databases that would ensure that everything that you put into the system becomes visible instantly. But actually, this allows for a lot of optimization that we are going to discuss briefly. And finally, aggregations can be composed. This is something that missed in something that can be described as the previous stage of aggregations that we call facet Elasticsearch. And this is the reason why uh, we build aggregations, which was to be able to compose aggregations together. So what does this composability mean in the context of aggregations? There are two main kinds of aggregations within Elasticsearch. The first kind can be described as bucket aggregations, which are basically responsible for taking a set of documents and partitioning into different sets of documents. And on the other hand, we also have metrics aggregation, whose responsibility is to take a set of documents and to compute something on this set of documents. So this can be anything from basic statistics, like minimum, maximum, average, and sum, to something which are a bit more interesting, like approximate percentiles and uh, unique counts. So when I said composability, what does it mean? Every bucket aggregation can have one, zero, one, or many, sub-aggregation that can be either bucket aggregation or matrix aggregation, and matrix ag aggregation can only be used as a leaf of an aggregation tree. So now I'm this might still sound a bit abstract at that, point, at that point, and I'm going to give a few examples of things that you can do with aggregation that you couldn't do with facet before because they lacked this composability. So first, let's try to think about uh, traffic analysis. Let's imagine that you are willing to build something that would look like Google Analytics, and very likely you would have documents about your traffic that look like this. You, 
which would have two fields, one about the source IP of the requests that have been performed on your website, and another one about the timestamp at which the request uh, has been performed. And if your documents look like this, you can run the, fo the following aggregation, which puts a cardinal aggregation on the source IP field under an histogram aggregation under the timestamp field in order to build this kind of chart that displays the unique amount of visitors that you got on a per day basis. Okay? So let's try another example because you, don't, you do not need to put a cardinality aggregation under a histogram, you can put something else. In that case, we, what we would like to do is some kind of performance analysis. Let's imagine that you are logging performance analysis of your application into Elasticsearch. Documents would typically look like this, with a response time and a timestamp. In that case, if you put a percentile aggregation under a histogram aggregation, and if, the, for example, the interval of the histogram aggregation is three hours, you would be able to have the percentiles, for example, the median 90th and 99th uh, percentiles of the response of your application for every bucket of three hours. So we just saw two basic aggregations. So let's try to see one that would be a bit more complex. And in order to understand the, the use case, so this time we are dealing about e-commerce. And for example, you are either a price comparison website or a marketplace, and you are indexing offers from different sites, and you'd like to build aggregations on this document. So your documents typically have one category, one site where they come from, one brand, a designation, and a price. And so let's try to run this aggregation to see what it does. So first, we are going to partition our, our data according to the category uh, the offer belongs to. In that case, Elasticsearch figured out that there are 23 dresses, uh, 19 shoes, and 8 skirts. And then, for each category, we want to compute two things. First, we want to compute the number of unique sites that sell items in this category. And for example, we got nine for the dresses category, three for the shoes category, and five for the short category. But we also want to compute the unique set of brands okay, who have items in this category. And I only put it for the dresses category, but you would have a very similar output for shoes and skirts. And for example, we found out that there are eight dresses of the brand Desigual uh, under this category. And then for each brand in each category, you also want to, to compute the minimum price. So you, you would also uh, have it in the output of Elasticsearch. Okay. So now that you should understand a bit more what aggregations are about and what they can do, I'm going to try to explain uh, why it makes sense to implement them on Elasticsearch. This might be a bit surprising uh, if you come from more traditional databases where you would have expected this kind of feature to be implemented, but actually there are very good reasons to implement it on Elasticsearch. One of them is that it's very powerful if you combine it with search because everything is computed dynamically and on the fly, which means that if your user initially entered one query, if you refine this query, you can recompute all these counts dynamically. Another reason is more on the implementation side, and the reason is that search engines have had uh, faceted search for a very long time, and one consequence of that is that search engines such as Lucene and Elasticsearch have a storage that is highly optimized for such use cases. I'm going to talk about it a bit more in the next slide. And aggregation basically are not a revolution in the sense that we didn't, we didn't need to rebuild Lucene in order to, to make it possible, but instead we are building on uh, existing uh, work which has been done in Lucene, and in particular in order to support uh, efficient uh, compressed uh, col columnar storage. So aggregations are fast, and I'm going to try to explain a bit why. So one reason why uh, aggregations are fast is that they are built on Lucene, and the trade-off of Lucene is to make search as fast as possible. So it's a very conscious trade-off, and if Lucene at someday has the choice to make either indexing faster or search faster, it's going to make search faster and then work on the indexing side in order to improve algorithm and maybe that data structure to make it as fast as possible, but the right, the, the focus is really on search. So this is obviously true for the inverted index, which is used in order to find the matching document, but this is also true for um, some columnar storage that Lucene has, which is called uh, doc values, uh, which are efficiently compressed. So if you come from Lucene, you would call it doc values. If you come from Elasticsearch, you would call it field data. But basically, it is exactly the same. And one important optimization 
uh, about this columnar storage is that Lucene and Elasticsearch nev never manipulate uh, string bytes directly. Instead, a Lucene index is actually made of a few, typically around 50, immutable indices, which are smaller. And in each of these immutable indices, strings are actually stored as enums. So why is it important? Because if you store these strings and store, the, store them somewhere in the file system, you can refer to these strings according to, to their ordinal. And for example, if you want to compare string A against string B, you don't need to compare the bytes, but you can directly compare the ordinals in order to understand if they are equal or which one is greater than the other one. So this is a, an optimization which is used uh, everywhere in the scene. And one last reason why they are fast is that no matter how many uh, levels of aggregations you have, everything is going to be computed in one single pass. So how does it work? So when you run a query with Elasticsearch, uh, basically you have something which is called the inverted index, which comes from Lucene, which, when combined with a query, is going to be able to tell you what are the matching documents. And typically, these matching documents are going to be written to you as an enumeration, and you are going to be able to uh, to have listeners on this iteration, and they are called collectors. Typically, by default, you would only always have the top hits collector, which is used in order to collect the top hits, but you can also plug in a collector for aggregations. And the important part about this slide is that I wanted to explain that computing aggregations and computing hits, top hits, is actually going to happen at the same time in the same uh, collection of your uh, document matches. Okay. Now, let's focus a bit more on the aggregations part. And basically, as I said, uh, no, I didn't say it, sorry. <laughs> uh, something uh, which is useful to know is that everything is stored sequentially in Lucene. So this, for example, this could be one segment, and this inverted index is going to give you uh, IDs of documents that matched. And for this index, which is stored sequentially, uh, we could have, for example, for example, two columns for two fields. So in that case, we have two fields, which are a category and a price which store the category and the price of the document. And in order to compute aggregation, Elasticsearch is going to take the bucket of the parent aggregation. So it could be the root, but it could also be the result of any other bucket aggregation. It would work exactly the same way. And then it will iterate over the matches. So first, we discover a new category for which there, were n there was no bucket, so we need to create a new bucket with a document count of one, and the price is going to be the price of the single offer that this bucket contains. Then the same happens with clothing, which is a category that we have never, never seen before. And then we see shoes again. So instead of creating a new bucket, what we are going to do is that we are going to go to the existing bucket, increment the document count by one, and update, if necessary, the minimum price. The minimum price is lower than the previous minimum price, so we need to, to update it. Again, a new category, so we, we create a new bucket. And for the last document in this set of matching documents, the price was higher than the previous pi price, so we don't need to update the minimum price. So this is really how it works at the shard level. However, Elasticsearch is not a single shard, single box search engine. Everything can run distributed, which means that you need to be able to merge results of several aggregations together. And the way it works is that Elasticsearch is going to take the tree of aggregations for every shard and to merge them together recursively by merging together buckets that have the same label. So let's take back this example and try to merge it with the results that we got on another shard. And basically, we are going to merge uh, recursively. So first, uh, we go on the shoes uh, category, and we can see that it's present in two aggregations. So we need to sum up counts. So the total count would be five. And then recursively, we go to the child aggregation, which is the mean price. And so we need to take the minimum of 50 and 60, which would be 50. We do the same with clothing. And it can also happen that some buckets are only present in one aggregation, in, what, in which case it's going to be very easy. We just need to recopy it verbatim. And we'll have our sub aggregation. And the same is true for accessories. And that's it. So we just get our merged uh, result for the aggregations. So on the third slide, I gave you examples of the aggregations that exist in Elasticsearch, in particular bucket and metrics aggregation. But actually, we have a few aggregations that I didn't mention. So something you could be interested in is that Elasticsearch has some basic support for uh, document relations when it comes to aggregation. And in particular, if you know about nested documents in Elasticsearch, 
uh, you need to know that we also have nested and reverse nested aggreg aggregations in order to make it very easy to leverage these relations in aggregations. We also have something which is called significant terms that Macawood, who created them, uh, usually said that it's helpful to, fa to find what is uncommonly common in your data dataset. This can be typically useful in order to uh, detect fraud, for example, or to, if you take a database of comments about uh, products, sorry, a database about, of comments about products, to get what are the most important terms about a particular product. Uh, for example, for a particular car, it could be that it, it's dangerous or it's very nice, etc. So this is a kind of information that you could extract. There is also a new aggregation which is going to come in Elasticsearch 1.3, thanks to Martin, who is here, which is the top hits aggregation, which is going to help you compute the top hits for every bucket. So if we go back to our example about e-commerce, this means that, for example, for every category, you could return the top hits to the user. So let's imagine that he, your user enters the query, you would be able to return the top hits for the shoes category, for the skirts categories, etc. And one last thing that I wanted to mention is that performance and memory usage of aggregations improves a lot in general, and in particular in the last release, which was done uh, last week, uh, which was Elasticsearch 1.2. So if you are already using aggregation, I highly recommend to, to upgrade. And in particular, if you are using uh, disk-based uh, field data, uh, performance will be much better now. So that's everything I wanted to say. So thank you for at your attention, and if you have questions, I think we still have a few minutes uh, to try to answer them. Uh, hello, yeah, the aggregation stuff's really very cool, very nice. Um, you mentioned about um, aggregating across segment, um, individual segments or um, across different, um, I guess, in, in indices. Um, how about things like cardinality, you know, where you're going to get some sort of error, right, because you don't know exactly what, what, um, what the cardinality things when you merge, and how, how do you cope with that? So actually, we are not using uh, a current algorithm to do that. So for both the cardinality and the percentile aggregations, we are using approximate algorithm. And so if you know about hyperlog log++, this is the name of the algorithm that you, we are using in order to compute cardinalities. And if you know about t-digest, Ted Dunning is here, is the father of this algorithm. This is the algorithm that we are using for the percentile aggregation. So this algorithm has been designed to, be, to not be fully accurate, but to be able to work in a distributed environment when you, where you cannot know about all the data at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Theoretically, do you be able to build a perfectly accurate aggregator for those as well? You could keep all of the items, unique items, if you really wanted to get an exact unique count. It just would be tremendously expensive, right? Yes, and that's something we, we don't want to, to allow users to do. Yeah. If that makes sense. Hello. Uh, are there plans to do uh, efficient pagination on aggregations? So, sorry, can pa you repeat? Pagination. Okay, so the question is about pagination on aggregations? On aggregations, exactly. Okay, so I think this is something that we are not going to do, okay, because it's complicated. If you want to do pagination, it typically, it typically means that, for example, let's take the example of a terms aggregation. It typically means that you have a lot and lots of terms that you would like to be able to paginate on. And the thing is that it's not an easy issue, not an easy problem to solve to have accurate counts of a large cardinality field if data com comes from several shards and you don't want to forward the whole set of values to the node that coordinates the search. So if we find a way to, to make it uh, cheap, sure we will do it, but so far we, I mean, we, we, we don't know, I, I don't think we, we can solve it. But if someone has an idea how to solve it, ideas are welcome. Really? Question here. 
Hi. Um, what would be the influence on the memory consumption if you are, we are going to use aggregation? So sorry, what, what would be the influence? The influence on the memory consumption, so in, in addition to, to what we have anyways. So, so sorry, I didn't understand everything. So it's about memory consumption yeah. and with regard to what? Cost of memory. Co right, cost of memory. Okay, what's the cost of memory? So it depends on the aggregation that you, you'd like to run. And so typically, if you're running a terms aggregation, the memory usage is going to depend on the unique number of terms that your, your field has. So on every shard, so on every shard. So I gave this example typically, and on every shard, Elasticsearch is going to build one bucket for every uh, existing term in your shard. So the more, and everything is going to be loaded in, into memory. Hopefully, it's highly compressed, and something, so as I said earlier, Lucene and Elasticsearch almost never used Byte in order to actually represent uh, terms. They use ordinary instead. And what would happen in that case is that we would first um, not use the string representation of the category here, but it's ordinal, okay? And we would then we would prune in order to find the top categories, and only after that, only after that, we would replace the ordinal with the actual bytes of the category. So it's optimized, but obviously you have a memory usage which is linear with the number of buckets that you have. So this is an example for the uh, terms aggregation. And we also have aggregations where you can uh, trade some memory for accuracy. So this is typically the case for um, percentiles and cardinality, where you, 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 have, uh, so you have a way to say, please use uh, more memory in order to improve the accuracy, or less memory because I, I want it to be as light as possible. So it depends on the aggregation we are talking about. Yeah, so basically it's just a rounding function? Or? Please repeat the question. Okay, so the, the question is about how do histogram work? Okay, so can I use my own uh, mapping function in order to map uh, timestamps to buckets? So we are to, in the context of the histogram aggregation, which is going to build buckets. So by default, there, are, uh, there is a high number of intervals that are predefined, which are typically minute, or you can say three hours, five days, uh, five months, etc. But if you want to do something which is more complicated, and in particular, which would not be a fixed side per bucket, what you would need to do would be to use a term aggregation and to use a script in order to, to define your bucket. So typically, you could say, for that year, I want buckets of one month, and for that year, I want buckets of one week. This is something you could do with a term aggregation. So the reason why I'm saying that is that um, the, histograms, the histogram aggregation is actually a specialized term aggregation, which is going to merge several buckets together. Okay, and this is something that you can do with a script in Elasticsearch. The reason why we have a histogram aggregation is that it's typically used for dates and we need special handling for that. In particular, we want to allow you to use date math. Okay, but you could definitely use a uh, terms aggregation with a script in order to generate the labels of your buckets and you, you could do pretty much everything that you want. Adrian, thank you very much for your talk. As always, we are running out of time. Um, now there is lunch break, so have a good meal, and thanks. Thank you.